So hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Omer Kurant, uh, and I'm very happy to have you here with us today. Uh, thank you for joining us in this special online event uh, we have organized on the occasion of the World Day to Combat Desertification and Drought. As you may know, our globe is passing through a process of more and more drastic climate changes due to the global warming. Uh, these are all affecting every aspect of our nutrition, good health, and sustainable development. The World Day to Combat Desertification and Drought, celebrated today, June 17th, aims to bring awareness and calls for the prevention, detection, and the application of smart management solutions in such a manner that the future generations will enjoy a habitable place on Earth. This year's theme learning from the past to fight desertification today clearly demonstrates uh, advanced solutions based on antique yet sophisticated methods. Mashav, Israel's agency for international development cooperation, is actively contributing to the global effort to achieve the UN's SDGs and is joining the campaign to promote global desertification awareness. This is being done through numerous daily actions, such as this online event presented to you today by a renowned professional. Before we start the session, I would like to invite Ms. Shuli Kurzon van Gelder, Director of Planning, Evaluation and Partnerships of Mashav, to say a few words. Ms. Shuli, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon and good evening to all, wherever you are, maybe. I would like to thank you on behalf of Mashav for joining us on this special day. My name is Shuli Kurzan van Gelder and I'm the Director of Planning, Evaluation and Partnerships in Mashav, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation. In recent years, we have started a tradition of marking international days that are relevant to Mashav activities and today we are marking the desertification and drought day. In relating to the importance of finding ways to face the challenges of desert present, uh, the desert presents, learning from the past to fight the desertification today is the name of the lecture today. In the Jewish religion, there is a phrase of, just a minute, know where you came from and where you are going to. The importance of knowing the history and then you can fight our, or uh, chat or, um, see the challenges and see how you uh, cooperate with them. Thank you for, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Pedro Berliner, Israel's focal point to the UN Convention to Combat Desertification and former director of the Blaustein Institute for Desert Research at Ben Gurion University. Thank you to Mashav's Agricultural Center and to Dalia Noy from my department for organizing this day, and we hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Mashav, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation, was launched 60 years ago to share the know-how and technologies which provided the basis for Israel's own rapid development. Mashav aims to empower those living in poverty in a holistic and innovative way and support fellow nations and communities in their struggle to achieve sustainable development, placing people at the heart of its initiatives. Our agricultural programs use unique techniques and farming methods to increase sustainability, food security, and hunger eradication. We believe that investment in education is an investment in our future and an agent for change around the world. We coordinate Israel's official humanitarian assistance, building medical facilities and supplying medicine in the wake of earthquakes, floods, famine, and other disasters. Mashav promotes innovative entrepreneurship as a means of advancing growth and prosperity. We believe that gender equality and women's empowerment are central to reach sustainable development. Our philosophy is to leave no one behind. During six decades, Mashav has trained over 300,000 people from more than 140 countries and has established development projects worldwide. Mashav, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation is celebrating 60 years of sharing its experience and partnering for a better world. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Julie Corzon van Gelder. Um, I would like to remind everybody that this lecture is being recorded uh, and will be available for your future use on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions during the session, uh, please use the chat button. Um, we will try to give some time for Q&A at the end of the lecture. Today's lecture is presented by Professor Emeritus Pedro Berliner. Uh, Israel's focal point of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification and former director of the Blaustein Institute for Desert Research at the Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Professor Berliner, if you may please, the stage is yours. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Loud and clear. Yes, yes sir. Loud okay. and clear. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be with you in the afternoon. And I would like to thank Mashaf for giving me this opportunity for sharing uh, my work and my coworkers' work and, and to uh, continue this uh, very uh, special trajectory of Mashaf as has been presented in 60 years. I've been proud to have been part of it in the past and I'm very uh, happy to be able to share with you our experiences now. I will now share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, the title of my presentation is uh, was already a. Uh, uh, mentioned is learning from the past to fight desertification today and to get us all on the uh, same wavelength that we know what we are talking I will use a few minutes to give a definition of desertification which uh, was defined by the UN Convention for Combating Desertification. It's uh, worthwhile to note that the United Nations has only three conventions one climate change, the second is for um, um, forgot it now in the moment, for a genetic variability, and the third one is for combating desertification, which means that it is a very important topic. Um, and as you can see here, it is a defined as land degradation and drylands, and includes a lot of factors which we will not detail at the moment, but a, it is important to define land degradation, which is basically the reduction or loss of the biological or the economic productivity. Um, I would put the emphasis on the biological productivity because the productivity may be decreasing. And if the price of the commodity is increasing, uh, this causes a bit of a problem. So we will concentrate on the biological productivity and uh, the dry lands, which is where uh, the um, desertification occurs uh, is defined basically as uh, the regions where uh, water is not enough to, for, to maintain primary productivity throughout the year. Uh, and it happens everywhere with exception of Antarctica, obviously. And uh, it affects a very large part of the population of our globe. Uh, these are the drylands, what you see here in yellow, and you can see they're very spread. So 35% of the earth. And if you see on the lower line, it is extremely important to our well-being and to the ecosystem functioning of the whole uh, globe. Uh, I would add here a topic which is relevant to my talk and uh, which we usually tend to forget. It is very closely associated with uh, desertification. It is the fact that we are facing a crisis that fuel wood is, a, I would say, a commodity that is becoming uh, less and less available to people who need it in order to light fires and thus cook and heat themselves. For many of us, we just turn on a stove, but this is not true throughout the world, particularly in developing countries, in which fuel wood is very, very important. And if you 
remember more or less the previous um, uh, slide, you will see that quite a large areas which were are defined as being uh, part of the drylands are here also showing signs of deficiency or acute scarcity of uh, firewood. Uh, just to exemplify this, this is in Angola, where I was not that long ago, and this is very, very typical of Africa. In the slide above, you see people, women, bringing firewood on their heads, coming from far away, walking kilometers to bring the firewood, and it's sold on the, on the roadside. This is a major uh, commodity in Africa and other centers of South America as well. Um, I would like now to introduce the place where I'm working and where we have carried out most of the work I'm going to talk today. Uh, as you can see, uh, this, what is greenish, is where we've got some sort of plant cover and the rest is dryland. And uh, this is part of the drylands. Actually, a large part of what you're seeing here is desert. You can see the Nile uh, Delta, which is green. Um, and uh, the red point, which actually more or less covers the whole of the state of Israel. Uh, to present you the state of Israel, on the left slide, you see the um, um, boundaries of Israel after the ceasefire lines in 48, and on the right hand side, the isolates. And uh, the um, lower part, the yellow part, is below 200 millimeters. Uh, this is Israel's desert, this is the Negev desert, and smack in the middle of it is the institutes where I'm uh, working, carrying out my uh, research. Um, this uh, area is less than 200 millimeters, is really not much, and I would like to add, this is a Mediterranean climate, meaning that this 200 millimeters are concentrated in a period of around three to four months. Um, so during four months, we've got very little rain. During the other eight months of the year, there's no rain at all, and it's usually quite hot. Uh, it is therefore very surprising that you can see, if you drive along the Negev, uh, scenes like this, you see on the top of the mountain, something that looks like a building, which uh, when we get closer, we see these are remnants of ancient cities. And this was a uh, very uh, strange because how can cities survive in the middle of the desert? And it was very clear that these were old cities during periods where there were no uh, aqueducts and water could not be brought to from large, uh, from far away. So uh, there were a lot, or there was a lot of archaeological work on who had built the cities, how did they survive? And uh, the city, by the way, is the name of Abdat. And it turns out that this city was a part of a whole network of cities which were part of the Nabataean Empire. This Nabataean Empire uh, coexisted more or less with the time of uh, uh, Judea, uh, more or less from 400 BC to uh, around 100 our area. And uh, it is became clear from uh, archaeological uh, work and some written evidence which was found in some papyri that uh, these people were mainly, their main uh, activity was in transferring goods from the Far East to the Mediterranean and then to, to Europe. The uh, spices and incense were one of their main um, uh, commodities they transported. Now, if you remember the slide I showed before, this was a desert and the question is how that they managed to cross the desert. And uh, the answer lies in this uh, slide in which you can see uh, water flowing, and this is in the middle of nowhere. Um, and as you can see in the picture as well, the moment uh, now when people are walking, but sun is shining. This is a very common occurrence in deserts, in deserts in this area, is you've got sudden downpours of water. Now this water is not absorbed by the soil, flows into this uh, dry riverbeds called wadis and is lost somehow. Uh, what the Nabataeans did, they were apparently extremely clever engineers. You can see here something which looks like just a very uh, desertic uh, scene, but if you get closer to this uh, bushes there, you look inside, you can see the remnants of a cistern. 
uh, this actual part of the cistern of the roof fell in, caved in, and that's why we can see water. Uh, what the Nabataeans did along their caravan route, they used this run of waters and uh, filled their cisterns. So they can, every few days of camels, they could stop and uh, drink the water. Obviously, uh, only they knew where the cisterns were and they, uh, nobody else could get close to them. Now, uh, more or less by the time of the Romans came into the area, um, they uh, cut off the Nabataeans, and they were unable to move their goods to the Roman Empire, empire and uh, they were forced to move to a different type of activity, which was mainly agriculture, and they used the skills of collecting runoff in order to produce agricultural crops. And here we enter now in a bit more of the uh, technical issue. Uh, why do we have these floods? in this area. What happens if you can see at the left side of the graph, the soil surface is in a sense sealed as a result of the impact of drops. In the upper part of the slide, you can see just crust. On the lower part, you can see the crust as it is colonized by some type of algae. But basically what these, these crusts do, they do not allow the water to infiltrate into the soil. And instead of infiltrating the flow overland, and they flow to the lower lying parts of the land. Uh, here we can see in a graph of rainfall and runoff patterns. And these show the very special patterns of rainfall in desert areas. The blue lines are the um, bursts of rainfall. You can see it's not a continuous rainfall, even though we quite often think that it is rather continuous. We have got burst of uh, rainfall with very high intensity. And the red line is the amount of runoff that is produced. We collect it in a way which I will show you in a minute. Uh, in interestingly enough, the green line shows that there is practically run no runoff if we've got very uh, presence of some plants, some annuals, a little bit of grass is enough to prevent this runoff from forming. And this, because at that point when we've got grass, the crust is covered and it's not that as efficient as it was uh, previously. Now, in this graph, in this picture, what we can see, we see the surface is covered like a very thin layer of water and the water is running into a lower uh, part of the plot. And here we've got a box which is collecting the runoff. Here we are actually measuring how much runoff we have. And this runoff is conveyed into a pit. And here we have as you can see, the water is already standing. Uh, we have, we are concentrating the water and where we concentrate the water, this trees can grow. This is, I would say, basic principle of runoff agriculture. And here we had a small plot. Here, what we can see is a very typical um, view of the Negev Desert, which is mainly, uh, you, I think we can call it rolling land or with a small hillocks. And what happens is the water is generated, the runoff water is generated on the slopes and flows into the lower lying part of the area. The right hand part here of the um, picture is a rebuilt Nabataean farm. And after a runoff event, we can see here the plots, which are full of water. They flow from left to right. The plots on our left are the highest one and on the right are the lowest one. The water fills in progressively the plots and cascades out of the farm. But the walls are built in such a way, in this case, they're around 30 to 35 centimeters height, that what is left inside the plot before the water moves on to the next plot is 35 centimeters. This is 350 millimeters of water in one event. In the case of this picture, the rainfall was a total of six millimeters, but produced 350 millimeters, which we could store in each plot. This is enough to produce a crop in an area where the total precipitation in this specific area, the annual precipitation is 80 millimeters, which is, to say the least, very, very little water. This is another picture of the trees. In this case, these are pistachio trees. And the water will disappear from the surface between a day or two, depending 
how dry the soil was. And then the trees will take up this uh, water and this water stored in the soil is enough to uh, carry them through the summer and produce yields. This is another view of another farm. And in this case, we see olive, oil, olive trees and uh, they are, let's say, larger plots which have already the direct agriculture value. Uh, we used this type of uh, concentration of runoff in order to develop a system which would provide people uh, with firewood and fodder and grain. I remember that I introduced the topic of firewood at the beginning as being crucial, and we thought that this system of collecting runoff was appropriate to produce uh, firewood, fodder, and grain in developing countries in which there is no uh, supply or no regular supply of wood, obviously in arid uh, countries. What you see here is a, a schematically precipitation which falls on an area, runoff R is generating, flows into a, a, a big basin, uh, which can be more or less close to an hectare, the water uh, flows in, the excess water flows out on the spillway on the left, and the water penetrates. What are here, uh, what appear to be trees, and in between we planted an intercrop, in between the rows of the trees. The idea here is to minimize the losses of water, which are, in this case, lost by evaporation, would be a complete loss to the system, and to produce uh, not only as much as we can, but also a variety of crops. Uh, here you can see our trees, which are uh, flooded. Uh, these trees, we use acacia, which is a legume, which fixes uh, atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, here we can see one of our uh, students from Gambia carrying out his um, measurements. The water is not that deep, he just was not that tall, but still, uh, we collect a lot of water here. The height is around uh, 50 centimeters of water uh, every time we've got a flood. Uh, again, uh, schematically, what we see is a tree, and the tree uh, produces the leaves can be used as fodder for animals. Uh, the trunk or the uh, branches can be used for firewood. And in between the rows of the trees, we plant a crop which depending on the crop we are planting can be for grain or fodder. This is depending when the flood happens and what we are interested in. Uh, here you can see uh, the plot in which you saw previously, which was flooded. Here we radically pruned the trees. We took off all the leaves and the branches. Again, the branches to be used uh, as firewood and the leaves as fodder. And in between these, uh, lines of tree, we planted the intercrop, which you can see here. In this case, it is wheat. And uh, the wheat started to develop while there was no leaves on the trees. So there was not, there was not much, or there was no competition for water or solar radiation. The moment that the trees start growing, the wheat reach, uh, reach a stage in which the water requirements are already smaller. Uh, we, by the way, this uh, trial, which I uh, presenting now, the results were carried out in the Turkana region in uh, Kenya. Uh, this is a, a ski which is used by ecologists when they want to compare the um, competition between two species. You plant one species on the X, X axis and one on the Y axis, and the extreme ones. The green one on the y axis and the rightmost one on the um, on the x axis, the brown, are those that connect the two crops when there's no intercrop present. This would mean that uh, any point which lies on this line, if we uh, decrease the uh, production by tree, we have uh, compensating it the production by the intercrop. You can see in our case the two red plants the two big red blobs there, when we uh, used, uh, when we intercropped our crop, our trees, but they were previously pruned and we had two densities, 
we produced more than what we would produce if we had planted the crops separately. This is very interesting and is unexpected um, because again, you would expect all the points to lie on this line which joins the two uh, points which I mentioned previously, which were without an intercrop. Nevertheless, we, uh, this was not the case. And the uh, reason is probably related to the fact that what we decrease here is one of the fluxes of water which we see as negative. Uh, on the right hand side, we've got the influx in blue, which is uh, the um, irrigation of runoff. In this case, we're talking about runoff. And in red are the losses. Uh, we can lose water by three different ways. One is by transpiration by leaves of the crop, which is what we are interested in. The more water the tree uses, the more it produces. And we've got uh, D is the drainage, is the water which is lost to the water table. Um, this depends if you're a hydrologist, you see this is something positive. If you're an agronomist, you see this is something negative because it does not contribute to uh, productivity of the crop. What I marked here with a circle is the evaporation. This is the water that is lost from the soil surface. This does not help anybody. It's a net loss. So if instead of losing the water between the rows of the trees, we plant a, an intercrop, we are using water that would otherwise be lost. And that is why when we plant the two crops, we intercrop our trees, we produce more than what we have, what we would have produced if we planted them separately. Now we went one step further and we said, okay, uh, we know now how to produce firewood fodder and uh, grains using water, uh, which is a marginal water resource. But what happens if I've got a crop? If I've got a crop, uh, they will uh, obviously take up a part of the nutrient. And if I would do this uh, for a long period of time, uh, finally, my intercrop would produce very low yields. So we decided to uh, improve on our previous system and actually to use part of the leaves, not for fodder, uh, but to compost them. And if we compost the leaf, we can add them to the soil. Remember, I'm talking about legumes. Legumes are very high um, in nitrogen content and the nitrogen comes from symbiotic activity from nitrogen from the atmosphere. So I'm getting here nitrogen practically free from the atmosphere. This is very important because nitrogen fertilizer is expensive and, not, and farmers not always have the resources to buy. So if we've got the composted leaf and we add it to the soil and then we plant our intercrop, we would have a system in which we are not only fertilizing, but it will be in a sense self-fertilizing. In other words, a system that will ensure its sustainability. Uh, here we've got a uh, picture of how the system uh, looked. Um, you can see here, this was the trees after being pruned. We have trees which were not pruned. We compared the intercrop with pruning and non-pruning. Um, these results are all present in articles which uh, you can uh, access. Uh, I will uh, leave behind the list with the articles which deal with this. Uh, what we see here in the front are this white, um, what appear to be boxes, actually they are covering plexiglass tubes in which we put uh, tubes which allow us to monitor the development of roots, uh, which are present here. We've got the tractor, we install our tubes very deep in the soil, they are plexiglass. On the left hand side you see the uh, miniature TV camera and we take pictures at very small intervals to see how the roots are developing, because this gives us an idea of the competition between the rules, the roots of the tree and the roots of the annual. Uh, here I'm presenting you some results, which I think are uh, show uh, what this fertilizer can do. We divided our soil into two layers, a top layer, which is from zero, uh, half meter, and the rest, which is from half a meter to one and a half meter. And uh, we measured the true uh, the, uh, the root length of the 
uh, roots of the tree. I will not enter the technique. It's quite complicated, but it works pretty well. And on the right hand side, we see what percentage of the water was taken up. And what you can see here is that, as expected, most of the water is taken up from the upper layer. And you can see also there's no really big difference between the various treated. You see the acronyms, which uh, P stands for uh, T stands T stands for tree, M for maize, and uh, I cannot, I put here something, and uh, C stands for compost. So the various combinations, you can see that the composting does not dramatically affect what happens in the upper pole. But when we go to the deeper soil, we can see that the red line, which is the one for the uh, prune trees with intercrop with maize and uh, with compost added, has more roots deeper in the soil layer. And these uh, increase in roots allows to take up more water from the deeper layers than the other treatments. This means this that we have, um, uh, in a sense, induced the tree to, pro to produce more trees, uh, more roots deep in the layer, and thus compensate for the water that was taken up in the upper layer by the maize. Uh, if we look at the results, you may remember that in the previous uh, graph I showed you, we had a line which joined the two extreme points on the y and the x-axis. What we have now, and we concentrate on the upper slide, we can see that basically the fact that we had um, an intercrop did not decrease the productivity of the trees. The yellow point and the red point, even though we had maize, we, this did not affect the productivity of the trees because it was composted. The red point on the top shows exactly that actually the moment we compost, we produce much more than the two individual uh, crops. This is remarkable. And in this case, we think that what we have reduced in addition to the, uh, the evaporation I've mentioned previously is the fact that once that the uh, tree developed and the maize was already um, had reached uh, quite an advanced stage, an advanced growth stage, there was shade on the maize, which means that um, the uh, demand for transpiration reduced and more uh, carbohydrates could be partitioned to the actual uh, fruit. Uh, these results are really very um, encouraging and mean that we can produce, um, a, or I would say enhance our productivity by uh, using the leaves, the composted leaves as fertilizer. Um, and when we look at the results, uh, we have put here a table, I will draw your attention only to the fourth line, which shows that uh, what is the nitrogen content in the end, at the end of the growing season, which means after we removed the crop. And you can see that the ones with the compost had a much higher content than those which did not, the, those that were not uh, fertilized with compost. And on the last column, you can see also the gross water use efficiency, which is the total biomass. In this case, it is the trees and uh, the intercrop per unit water. It's more or less double for the prune trees and maize and compost. This makes the system extremely efficient. And as well, the fact that we use the compost leaf makes it sustainable, something which is very important. So if we want to uh, summarize what I said up to now, the system is low cost. I did not stress this, but it's very clear to you that if we have to build a, um, a wall around a basin with uh, just soil, this is very simple and it's as low cost as this can. It is a distributed system in the sense that you can put it in anywhere within the landscape and uh, you do not have to concentrate all in one place. It's easy to implement. The maintenance costs are minimal. Actually, what the only thing you have to make sure is that you have got no holes in your retaining walls. Uh, and this is what we do. 
before any rainy season, we just walk around our uh, walls and make sure that there are no um, holes made by rodents. And if they are, we just plug them. It is flexible. We can use any crop we want. We work with quick growing trees because we have to carry out research and we don't want to wait that many years. But actually, the, uh, we can have legume trees which grow much slower, which are local species. You do not have to introduce species as we did and therefore minimize the risk of their um, being invasive species. There is very, very little risk of pollution. The amount of water does not reach the water table. Um, as I mentioned, it allows for the simulation of production of firewood, fodder, and grains, and the composting part of the leaves. And uh, as adding this composted uh, leaves to the um, soil, uh, dramatically increases the gross water use efficiency and this allows the sustainability of the system. I think in US, the SDGs, which are, we are talking so much about, such a system answers the basic requirement of developing and sustainability. I would, however, like here to add a word of caution. Under which conditions does its system? Uh, the soil has to be able to hold water. For example, this would not work on sandy soil because actual water would percolate and move out of the system where the roots of the system are. Uh, the soil has to be deep enough in order to be able to allow the roots of the trees to grow deep to an area or to a depth where the intercrop does not reach. The whole system is based on the fact that the uh, trees take up water from the uh, soil layers where the intercrop already took up water, so that there is enough water for the trees and for the intercrop. And the last one, which is a technolo technological issue, but it has, we have to keep it in mind, the wetting depth has to be such that it is wetting before, uh, below the maximum depth of the roots. For example, if we've got roots that reach two meters, we have to make sure that we wet all the, this total depth is two meters. Um, this we can obviously adjust by uh, adjusting the ratio of the area that produced runoff to one that received water. And um, I will not go into this because it's a well-known technicality, but we have to keep this in mind. Um, I showed you the picture of um, how the water was flowing at the, one of the slides. Uh, this is on a different scale. These are micro catchments. The micro catchments were uh, very interesting. They are very interesting mainly for soil physicists because the system is small, it can be studied easily. But uh, we found, uh, this is, I'm showing again the uh, slide I showed you previously. We found that the system was not efficient. It didn't work properly. And we were very worried about it. And uh, once uh, we decided to carry out some simulation study, we immediately found out why the system was not uh, efficient. Here we dug pits of different depth and have applied to them the same amount of water. And you can see in the lowest uh, slide on the uh, left hand side that the water, uh, the, the water we, uh, with, uh, with which we flooded the uh, pit reached a certain height, but did not reach the surface. So water was evaporating only from the bottom of this pit. In the intermediate slide, you can see that water uh, reached higher part and it wetted the rim. In the uppermost uh, layer, we see the pit, which is a shallow one, the 30 centimeters. And this were the depths of the pits we used for our micro catchment. Water spread horizontally. And we've got here very large losses of water. This means that for micro catchments, which were built this way, we collected water, but most of the water was lost by evaporation. So we decided to change the geometry of this system. And instead of having a micro catchment, we actually uh, collected the water in a trench. Uh, it's something like a slit trench, meaning that the surface exposed to the atmosphere is very low and therefore water cannot evaporate from the bottom of the pit or will evaporate very low. And the depth is such 
that uh, a wetted soil will not be on the surface. Uh, we did this with a uh, trial, which some of you may find of interest. We measured the water in the soil using neutron probe, which gives us the total amount of water loss. We flooded the micro catchment, the convention micro catchment, and the trench with the same amount of water. And we measured also how much water is moving through the trunk of the tree with a system in which we are constantly heating a probe and measuring the rate of cooling of the probe, which is function of the amount of water which flows through the trunk. And uh, monitoring this uh, transpiration rate, we see that uh, the upper line, which is the stippled uh, line of the uh, uh, trenches, uh, we are able to maintain a more or less constant transpiration for a period of more or less 100 days, while the transpiration in the conventional micro catchments decreases dramatically. Uh, the reason for it is that the water that got lost, that was evaporated from the micro catchment was kept in the system of the trenches and thereby uh, was um, available for the plants to transpire. Once again, this shows the importance of evaporation in systems in um, arid zones. Here we've got a nice view of our experimental system. These are olive trees which we uh, planted. The water flows from right to left. And this is the system uh, uh, two and a half years after planting them. Uh, I'm standing there so you can see the trees are pretty high and produced uh, rather well. Um, before ending, I would like to add uh, another word about direct evaporation from the soil surface because I believe that this is very, very important. We carried out a trial in which we uh, simply maize is a, is a um, I would say, a test crop. And we used two systems, furrow system or trickle irrigation. And in both cases, we left it or open to the atmosphere or we cover it with a polyethylene sheet. Covering with a polyethylene sheet means that there's no evaporation. We carried out all the measurements, which uh, I will not enter into detail, but in when we had no uh, polyethylene sheet, more or less 40% of the total amount of water lost was lost by direct evaporation. I would like to emphasize this, that this was also in the case of drip irrigation. Even though we had um, drip irrigation, very large amount of water were lost to the atmosphere under the conditions we carried out this trial. And here just we compare what are the evaporative losses. Furrow was slightly higher than drip, but still the amounts were very high. This is just to emphasize the central part of evaporation of water from the soil in systems in arid zones. We have to minimize evaporation in order to maximize our productivity. And with this, I would like to end and thank you all. Thank you very much, Professor Pedro. Um, virtually, I'm sending my applause here. Thank you very much, it was fascinating. Um, I see we have still some spare time and uh, till the moment we have no uh, question in the chat so if any of you wants to take advantage of the opportunity and uh, raise a question even uh, uh, speaking you can raise your hand or also use the chat feel free I have just opened the opportunity to unmute yourself. So anybody who wants to ask a question, this is the time. Or maybe everything was very clear. <laughs> Let me just scan. I don't see anyone raising the hand. So I will take the opportunity to ask a question myself, Mr. Pedro, if I may. Sure. So I saw in the beginning 
uh, we spoke a little bit and uh, the back background uh, photo behind you, uh, it was very weird for me as, uh, as an Israeli um, seeing a, an almond tree in the desert um, landscape. As I'm, a, I'm sure maybe lots of us know that uh, almonds are uh, raised in Israel in the northern part, in the more uh, humid parts. So uh, I would love to hear a little bit about uh, the, in, the at, at intentions to drive new borders of uh, plantations out of the natural habitat. Uh, well, uh, the, you're right that almonds are not grown usually in the desert, uh, even though from the climatic point of view, temperatures, low temperatures, uh, the, the temperatures would be fine. Um, and uh, we tried here a very large number of crops. Almonds uh, were one of them, but uh, what, uh, and they grew very well. Their yields were very good. But what happened to the almonds and to the pistachio trees is that they uh, it turned out to be uh, not uh, commercially viable because during the war between Iraq and Iran, Iran uh, topped the market with their production of almonds and pistachio and the price uh, dropped dramatically. <laughs> Thereafter, uh, the United States, had, particularly in California, um, had huge plantations of both pistachio and almonds and the prices dropped. And uh, to, for our conditions here, it was uh, not uh, really viable in economic terms. So this is why we, uh, it's just a very nice picture when the almond is in bloom, but it is not um, economic for our conditions. But grows well. I guess, yeah, thanks. I guess one of the reasons for the lack of uh, viability is due to water costs in Israel. Um, and there's a question now in the chat uh, exactly uh, regarding uh, water, uh, asking what is the source of the water used and the quality of the water uh, in producing the compost and what was the nitrogen source aside from the leaves? Okay, uh, I, I, I'm assuming that he's asking the water for the flooding. Uh, the water from the flooding is runoff water, which we collect from the surrounded areas. Um, usually it's very, very good quality water. Um, we tested, uh, for example, uh, the concentration of salts in the soil profile before flooding and after flooding. And a result of flooding, the concentration of salts decreased, indicating that the water is of a very good quality. Incidentally, depending where the water flows from, it brings also manure from the uh, herds in the vicinity, which is also a source of um, uh, uh, nutrients. Uh, the composite leaves, we only use the leaves as compost, so the uh, nitrogen comes wholly from the leaves we composted. Wow. I see Mr. Hardip has a question. Yes, uh, Mr. Pedro, good afternoon. Uh, you know, uh, we have uh, very similar conditions uh, in the outer Himalayas. If you see the Shwalik area and the area down below. So I worked in the state of Himachal Pradesh, which is in Himalayas in India. You know, there the runoff is because the slopes are very precipitous and the runoff is very fast. And secondly, there is because the soil is loose, there are uh, uh, boulders and so there is a huge tunneling effect. So loss of water on the surface is very heavy and almost desert-like conditions are created in this part. But we did an experiment that we created small water harvesting structures within the system itself, maybe small, we created some small dams and then the water collected there. And then the water was effectively used by drip irrigation for raising crops and also by flood irrigation where the drip irrigation is not possible. Why in such areas, which you have shown in your diagram uh, where the water runoff is there, why not create some artificial ponds for harvesting this runoff water and later use it for drip irrigation or something like that rather than 
uh, uh, letting the water stagnate as that I have seen a knee deep water, the, somebody was wading into that uh, orchard where the water was knee deep. Why this knee deep water should be allowed to stagnate in a crop rather than it should be collected in a, in a, in a man-made uh, pond or a pool or whatever you call it as. What could okay. be the reason for not doing so? Okay, uh, there are a few, a few answers. There are a few reasons. Uh, the first one, uh, you see the water you saw in the crop uh, stands there for not more than two days. It uh, uh, percolates into the soil. So the water is not stagnant. It doesn't stay there for very long. Uh, the second one is that uh, because we can work the soil, to, uh, break the crust, uh, once the upper soil, and I'm talking about the centimeters, dries out, something which happens very, very quickly, in arid areas, it is an effective bar barrier to water evaporation. And uh, therefore, the evaporative losses are dramatically reduced. Actually, we have measured in uh, this basins without trees. Uh, we have collected the water and kept it in the soil. And months after the flood event, the soil profile is really wet. Uh, and I would like to emphasize the idea was to develop a system which could be used by people which do not have any infrastructure in terms of electricity or power which you would need for a uh, trickle irrigation. Uh, another additional uh, reason is that um, when you construct these uh, reservoirs uh, in arid zones, the evaporation continues from the upper, from the uh, open surface, which means that you are losing, for example, in our case, our evaporation in summer is around eight millimeters per day. This means that you are losing a large fraction of water throughout the period where you are irrigating. Not only that, but uh, because what evaporates is water, there is a concentration of salts. And we had areas in Israel where this uh, this concentrate of salt percolated, reached the water table, in this case the water tables were shallow, and actually damaged the uh, water table. Now, the latest uh, version we have now, but this is something which I'm not sure would be easy to implement in an area in which they do not have the financial resources to do it, we are covering our reservoirs with uh, solar panels. What we are doing in this case, what this means is that the solar panels completely cover the surface, which means we've got zero evaporation. And the solar panels produce electricity, which can be used in order to run pumps. In this case, we would do what you were suggesting, which is used for, a, for example, for drip irrigation, but you have to take in account that this requires investment. Yeah, Mr. Harib, another question before Mr. Elliot. Uh, you're on mute, Mr. Harib. Uh, I, I, mute another yourself. question. Another question. You know, if you remember, uh, if you have uh, seen the condition in the Doha Asian Games, when they held the Doha Asian Games, during the opening day, I happened to be there, it was a very heavy rain. And in the desert, because there is a conquer pan, the percolation is very low. And the entire Doha was flooded in knee deep water. They had no, uh, you know, uh, system to, to, to drain that. So don't you think whatever you have suggested, they are location specific remedies and the people will have to work in their area in order to find out something which is very, you know, uh, you, uh, endemic, endemic solutions rather than, rather than the uh, generalized solutions. That's, uh, that's always true. Uh, we are presenting a solution which Case works study, under yes. these conditions. It will right. work under similar conditions, but everything has to be adapted. You cannot uh, transfer technology without testing them. Definitely. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harip. Uh, Mr. Elliot, I saw you wrote. Thank you. Yes, hand. indeed. Professor Berliner, thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating lecture. And, I've, and you mentioned about solar energy. What I wanted to ask you is what about drinking water for, for 
for human use if it's if we're talking about settling or the ancient Nabataeans how what do they what do you do about that well uh, I think I, I showed a slide uh, they used to store the water in cisterns uh, they move the water by gravity we've got here dolomite rock which is relatively easy to carve to use a cistern out of it and they used the system the systems may and this is important related also the previous uh, uh, question, uh, they were all uh, roofed uh, cisterns. So the evaporation was very, very small. Uh, obviously the same system can be applied today. Uh, the water will have to be purified uh, because it brings with it debris from the surrounding. Um, you use the solar energy to purify the water, then you've got a, a closed system there. Yep. Very much so. Yes, 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 very much so. This, uh, again, <clears throat> we have to keep in mind, it depends on uh, the level of investment that uh, can be uh, devoted. It's, uh, All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Elliot. Uh, anyone else has a question before we will wrap up the session? Right, I see all questions are answered. If you still will have some questions, uh, you can always send us an uh, email. Can... Yeah, see Mr. Naoya. Yeah. yeah. Shalom and to the Rabbah. Thank you very much for the very impressive presentation. I always love Israel. Uh, well, one, just one simple question. I'm from Japan and there's a Japanese doctor uh, who is implementing reforestation project using cyanobacteria, you know, the microorganism. And I'd like to know if Israel and uh, Mashab also has a similar technology to revive uh, the desert or, or uh, using microorganism. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, this is not directly linked to my presentation, but in our case, the cyanobacteria uh, are extremely important because they colonize the crusts. Uh, and this uh, colonization of the crust makes them, uh, in some cases, impermeable. This is particularly true in sandy soils. Uh, these crusts uh, allow the establishment of shrubs and grasses in our dune system in the south. Uh, and as such, they're being studied, uh, but we have not used uh, cyanobacteria is a source of uh, nutrients for our crops. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Naoya. If there aren't any more questions, I'm uh, putting here in the chat our uh, YouTube channel link. This uh, session will be uploaded to this channel. Um, any question you may have, you can write us in the future. We will transfer the question to our professionals. I would like to thank you everybody uh, for taking your time and joining us today. I would like uh, to thank again our lecturer, Professor Pedro Berliner. It was fascinating. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, give thanks for the people working with us on this event. Uh, Ms. Dalia Noy, Ms. Shuli Kurzon van Gelder from uh, Mashav, also my colleague here, Iran, from our center in MATC. Um, till next time, we'll have uh, more events uh, of this type. Thank you, everybody. Hope to see you soon in our upcoming events. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Omel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor Bellina. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. For listening. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for an interesting and fascinating lecture. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.